Hello, I am Angela Wardle and I'm going to talk to you about the evidence for glassworking in Roman Britain. Glassware is often thought to be a luxury product in Roman Britain and indeed at the time of the conquest in AD 43, imported glass vessels from Italy and Germany were certainly expensive. The invention of glass blowing about a hundred years before the Romans arrived in Britain meant that glass vessels could be produced in greater numbers and they gradually became mass-produced and more commonplace. Glass wasn't always used for vessels. In buildings, there was window glass, and more rarely glass tessery that highlighted details in a mosaic, such as face details and headdresses. See our household film for window glass. In jewellery, some beads and bangles were made of glass. See both our beads and bracelets films for examples. Glass may have become more affordable and commonplace, but it is still comparatively rare on excavations, in part due to its fragility, but also because glass was regularly recycled. Evidence for the recycling and reworking of glass to make new vessels is now being found throughout the empire, including Roman Britain. The evidence for glass working is particularly strong in Roman London, from where most of my examples are taken. It is important to understand the distinction between glass making, the preparation of new glass from raw materials, and glass working, the working of fresh or recycled glass into vessels and objects. The main ingredients of Roman glass were silica, in the form of sand, soda, which was used as a flux to reduce the melting point of the mixture, and calcium, in the form of lime, which acted as a stabiliser. Primary production sites with large rectangular tank furnaces have been found in the eastern Mediterranean, notably in Egypt, for example at Wadi al Natrun, a source of mineral soda. Iron oxide, an impurity in sand, produces the characteristic blue-green shades of glass seen here. But other minerals were added to give a variety of bright colours popular in the early 1st century AD. Manganese and antimony were added to produce the clear colourless vessels which became fashionable in the later 1st century. Secondary workshops in towns across the empire depended upon supplies of fresh glass imported in large blocks which was supplemented by recycled glass in the form of broken vessels and production waste, known as coloured. Broken glass was a valuable commodity, and the Roman poet Martial records that in Rome it was exchanged for sulphur matches. The largest dump of coloured ever found in Roman Britain came from Guildhall Yard in London, close to the site of the amphitheatre. The illustration is part of a large dump from 35 Basinghall Street, close by. There is only limited evidence for the structure of Roman glass furnaces, which are known on the continent only from ground plans. This lamp from Slovenia shows a low domed structure, and this shows an experimental furnace built by David Hill and Mark Taylor, based on archaeological evidence where the glass was melted in crucibles. There is evidence that glassworking was widespread in the Roman world and large cities such as Rome may have been served by many permanent workshops. Evidence has been found for glassworking in such smaller towns in Britain as Mansetta, Leicester and Roxeter, and the process may have been carried out by itinerant craftsmen. This may well have been the position in larger Romanish British towns as well. For example, in London, where we now have production waste from over 25 sites, the evidence clusters in different areas at different times, ranging in date from the late 1st to the late 3rd century. So what can one expect to find in a glassworking assemblage? The examples here are taken from London sites, mostly from 35 Basinghall Street, located in the Upper Walbrook Valley, a marshy industrial area on the periphery of the, as yet, unwalled town in the 2nd century. It lies to the north of the 1st to 2nd century Guildhall Yard Cullet Dump and is slightly later in date. The site produced over 70 kilograms of broken vessel glass and production waste and appears to be the debris from a failed furnace when it was abandoned. All the evidence from London suggests that glass was prepared for heating and blowing, not in a small crucibles, but in a tank furnace, so-called because of its rectangular shape. Such furnaces were built of brick earth and contained a tank made of fired brick and tile, 
which was suspended over a firebox. The image shows furnace fragments from Moorgate, with molten glass adhering to the surface, and large fragments of tank metal, solidified glass, from the basing hall furnace, shows a straight edge from the side of the tank. Normally, such glass would have been crushed and remelted, but this was discarded when the tank failed. Fragments of tank metal can be of different colours depending upon their position in the tank and the degree of oxidisation, but some of the very bright blue glass seen here might have been imported fresh glass. This cullet may have been deliberately crushed to prepare it for melting in the furnace. As the cullet was heated within the tank to a working temperature of over 1000 degrees centigrade, small globules and droplets split off dropping to the furnace floor. The presence of these droplets suggests that the material is from the furnace itself. At Basinghall, blue-green droplets and colourless examples show that different batches of glass were being melted. Runnels and flows were also produced within the furnace. Threads and trails, some very small, are typical of glassworking waste and are produced at various stages in the process. As they are so fragile, their survival indicates that the waste may have come from the immediate vicinity of the blowing area. In order to make a vessel, a blob or gather of glass was removed from the tank on a blowing iron and was rolled on a marble stone, here shown during experimental work by Mark Taylor. These gathers show the outline of the blowing iron. The gather was then blown and inflated on the iron, a technique that has changed little over the centuries and can still be seen today. At this stage, the gather was sometimes cleaned of impurities and waste using pincers or other tools, and tool marks and small lumps of clay can be found on these fragments. The most significant type of waste, diagnostic of glass vessel production, was the moil. A small cylinder of glass left on the blowing iron after the vessel was detached. Each blown vessel produces one moil. Some moils show crizzle spots, crazing of the glass where it has come into contact with a drop of cold water to help crack the vessel from the iron. At the other end, where the moil was wrapped around the iron, there is a characteristic ridge which makes it possible to identify moils from very small fragments. There is great variation in the sizes of moils, but this appears to reflect the technique of the individual craftsman rather than the type of vessel which was being produced. The moil wraps from Basinghall Street, seen here, show that both blue-green and dark blue vessels were made there. Samples of moils and other waste from the site were analysed in order to establish the origins of the raw materials and to identify different batches of glass used in the production cycle. Such analysis has great potential for future studies. Most of the moils from London are cylindrical, produced in the manufacture of narrow-necked vessels such as files and jugs, or open vessels with folded rims, but wider lid moils found at Basinghall Street in colourless glass come from vessels with wide mouths and cracked-off rims such as cups and beakers. The lid moil was removed from the vessel when cold. The illustration shows a replica cup made by David Hill and Mark Taylor with its lid moil attached and another with the moil removed. Excavated lid moils are usually very fragmentary. This complete example comes from an experimental vessel. Such decorated vessels were blown into moulds, as this example of a similar vessel from Cologne shows, and this replica sports cup, showing a chariot race. Square glass bottles were also made by being blown into suitable moulds. Their handles were then applied. Unless a vessel had a simple cracked off rim, when the lower part was complete, it was fixed at its base to a solid pontil rod by means of a pontil pad, so that the neck could be worked and any handle attached. Pontil pads have been recognised among the production waste, and this example shows staining from the iron rod. This replica cup also shows the mark of the pontil pad. Tooled waste from the attachment of handles has also been found. Pincer marks can be seen on these fragments. Wasters give us more information about the vessels being made in London. 
This is a heat-distorted collapsed rim, probably from a flask, while this handle, with a large inclusion, has clearly failed quality control. Glass vessel production was an important and widespread industry in the Roman world, and with every discovery of production waste, our knowledge of this industry and its organisation is increasing.